In the previous lecture, we considered the implications of space group symmetry on the structures of extended solids, you know, intermetallics, ionic compounds, uh, covalent network solids. And in those types of crystals, we saw that there is oftentimes quite high space group symmetry. And that places certain restrictions on where the atoms can go within the unit cell. In this lecture, we're going to look at crystals made of molecules, molecular crystal structures, and we're going to see that things look quite different. As we saw last time, when we look at the frequencies of different space groups sorted by crystal system, we get a very different picture for organic substances than we do for inorganic substances. Namely, we see that most organic compounds crystallize in these lower symmetry orthorhombic, monoclinic, and triclinic crystal structures. And if we were to look a little bit closer at the most common space groups seen for organic compounds, we would see that there's even less variety than the last table would suggest. A whopping 58%, over half of all organic crystal structures, go into one of two space groups. Either the monoclinic P2 sub 1 over C, or the triclinic P1 bar. And then if we were to include the next four most common space groups seen for organic crystals, we would find that 83% of all organic crystal structures belong to one of these six space groups. Remember, there are 230 space groups, so we see that the organic chemistry boils down to a very strong preference for a relatively small number of space groups. And that leads us to the question, what is it that these space groups have in common? Well, the first thing you might notice is that there are no higher order rotation axes, you know, above two. And that's why we don't see trigonal, hexagonal, tetragonal, cubic space groups very often. The next thing you might see is even amongst the orthorhombic and monoclinic examples here, Generally, we're seeing two sub one screw axes rather than a twofold proper rotation axis. So only the C2 over C has a twofold rotation axis. And remember from a few lectures back that C2 over C also has a two sub one screw. The other thing that you might see if you looked carefully enough is that none of these space groups contain a mirror plane. P2 sub 1 over C has a glide plane, C2 over C has a glide plane, and PBCA has three glide planes. But amongst these six space groups, you won't find even one single mirror plane. And so what is it about these operations, the screw axes and the glide planes and inversion centers that is favored in organic crystals? The bottom line is it has to do with the way that non-spherical objects like to pack together. Think about, for example, if you had two peanut-shaped objects. Well, the most efficient packing wouldn't be to have a mirror plane between them. You know, you would want to offset them in some way, like you might have with a glide or a screw axis. And so that's why we see this kind of preference for these sorts of space groups. Honing in on this even a little bit further, let's look at the space groups that arise from a primitive orthorhombic Bravais lattice with point group 222. In this point group, we have twofold rotations or two sub one screws, but no mirrors or glides. Look at the striking change in the frequency of crystal structures found in the Cambridge database, that's going to be organic compounds, and crystal structures found in the ICSD. It'll be inorganic compounds, as we add more screw axes. So we see a very, very strong preference for three two sub one screws, which accounts for many, many crystal structures, whereas the P222, which has all proper rotation axes, is in fact very rare. That's something that we're just in general going to see when we work with molecular substances. Now, what is the relationship between the symmetry of a molecule, its point symmetry, and the symmetry of a crystal of that molecule? As an illustrative example, let's look at the isomers of xylene. 
Here they are, the ortho, meta, and para isomers of xylene. Why don't you stop the video and take a look at this and see if you can tell me what is the point group symmetry of each of these molecules. Okay, what did you get? Well, if we assume that the methyl groups have free rotation, then the hydrogens are not going to break the symmetry. So then we can find in orthoxylene there is one twofold rotation axis, which I show here. All of the molecules are flat, so we have a mirror plane in the plane of the molecule. That would be parallel to the twofold. And then there's another mirror plane which is going to be you know, vertical here that splits the molecule in half right along the twofold. And so the point group here is MM2, or in Schoenflies, that would be C2V. When we look at the metaxylene, we see that there's also a twofold axis, and we still have the horizontal mirror plane and then the vertical mirror plane that splits the molecule in two along the twofold axis. So both of those mirror planes are going to contain the twofold axis, so this molecule also has the same point group symmetry. When we come to paraxylene, now we see that we have more symmetry. We have a twofold rotation axis that's along the para direction, if you want to call it that. But we have also a twofold rotation axis that is perpendicular to that. That would take this lower methyl group and bring it up to this upper methyl group. And we also have a twofold rotation axis that is perpendicular to the plane of this projection. There are parallel mirror planes for each of those twofold axes. And so when you put all those together, you get point group MMM or D2H. Okay, so we see that the paraxylene has a different symmetry, a higher symmetry than the other two isomers. Now what happens when we make crystals from these molecules? Well, the crystal structure of metaxylene is shown here. Crystallizes in an orthorhombic space group, PBCA. Right, that was one that was on our list of one of the six most common space groups for organic compounds. When we look at the crystal structure, we can count up a total of eight molecules per unit cell. So our Z, the number of molecules per unit cell, is going to be eight. Let's take just an opportunity to try out one of the heuristics we talked about in the last lecture. We said that you know, if you don't know the density and you're trying to figure out Z, you can get some ballpark idea for organic compounds by assuming that each atom is going to have a volume of 10 cubic angstroms. So in this metaxylene molecule, you know, the molecular formula is going to be C8H10. There's going to be 18 atoms. And if we had eight molecules, eight times 18 is going to give us 64 carbons and 80 hydrogens. That's a total of 144 atoms in the unit cell. Now, if we just did that very rough estimate of Z, you know, a volume of 1347, if we divide that by 10 cubic angstroms, we would get 135 atoms in the unit cell. 135 and 144 are not too far apart. If we're rounding to the nearest 18, then um, you would come up with eight molecules per unit cell. Uh, the next closest number would be seven, but you'll see that it doesn't make a lot of sense to have a Z equal to seven in an orthorhombic space group like this. So we could have probably figured out a priori from the unit cell volume and just the molecular formula that we're likely to have eight molecules per unit cell. Now let's take a little closer look at the symmetry elements in this point group and how they relate to the crystal structure. So this is a diagram from the international tables. Here we're looking at the AC plane. That's probably the most illustrative view of this particular crystal structure. And when you look at all of these symmetry operations, what you're going to see is that you have three different glide planes and you have various two sub one screw axes. Uh, and, and here's another glide plane. 
but we don't have any mirrors and we don't have any proper two-fold rotation axes. All right, what do these symmetry elements have to do with the symmetry of each molecule? Well, if we start with this molecule as the first one we're going to put into the unit cell. Now let's see what the symmetry operations do to this molecule. We could start with the two sub one screw axes. Let's look at this two sub one screw right here. That's going to take this molecule and rotate by 180 and translate one half of the way of the unit cell up at us. All right? So that's going to generate this molecule that is highlighted in blue. If we take the two sub one screw axis that's right here, that's going parallel to the A axis, uh, that's going to rotate by 180 over to here and then uh, translate by one half unit cell and that's going to be this molecule. And then finally if we take the third two sub one screw, this is the one that is parallel to C, that's going to rotate by 180 and then translate by one half unit cell and that's going to give us uh, this one here. Okay, So we can see those three molecules that are highlighted in blue are all generated by the two sub one screws. Let's do the same thing for the glide planes. So there is the glide perpendicular to A, right? That's going to be the B glide. So that glide direction, the translation part, is up at us. So if you imagine the glide plane here, we're going to reflect through it and then translate up out of the plane by half a unit cell. That would give us this molecule highlighted in yellow. Uh, let's now take a look at this glide right here. That's going to be the A glide which is perpendicular to the C-axis. So that one is maybe the hardest to see because it kind of go, cuts through this molecule, but it's going to flip it around and then translate one half unit cell down to here. And then the third glide plane is this one up here, right, which is sitting above the plane of the projection by one quarter unit cell. So that's going to, we're going to reflect through that glide and translate one half unit cell. So the three molecules shown in yellow are created by the glide planes. And then the last symmetry element is the inversion center. Let's take a look at this inversion center here. That's going to take this molecule and bring it over here, uh, highlighted in green. So now if we look at this, we have eight molecules that are highlighted, the original one, three that are generated by screw axes. Those are the blue ones three that are generated by glide planes, those are the yellow ones, and one that's generated by the inversion, that's shown in green. And we know that we have eight molecules per unit cell. Now when we look at the Wyckoff sites of this space group, PBCA, we see that the general position has a multiplicity of eight. So that's telling us that these eight molecules are all related to each other by the symmetry operations of the space group. It also tells us that these glides and screw axes in the inversion center don't have any direct restriction on the symmetry of one molecule. Right? So you could have any symmetry you want for the first molecule, and then you're going to get all of the other atoms by the symmetry elements of the space group. So there's no direct relationship between that C2V symmetry of this molecule and the MMM symmetry of the space group. It's also worthwhile to think about these relationships in terms of when we're going to get into trying to solve crystal structures. Because z equals 8, and because the general position has a multiplicity of 8, we can talk about something called the asymmetric unit. The asymmetric unit is the part of the unit cell that if you know the atoms in the asymmetric unit and then you use both translational symmetry and then the point symmetry operations of the space group, you're going to generate every other atom in the crystal. So knowing the atoms in the asymmetric unit is enough to know everything about the crystal. And so what that means is that if we can determine where that molecule is located and the orientation of that molecule, just one molecule, then it's enough to know everything else about this crystal structure 
from the symmetry operations of the space group. Now, when we're doing structure solution from powder diffraction data, it's sometimes not so straightforward from a powder pattern, which has a limited amount of information in it, to locate all of the atoms in the unit cell. There are 18 different atoms in this molecule, and if they're all on the general position, that means there's an X, Y, and Z coordinate associated with each of those 18 atoms. So there's 54 variables that would have to be specified to determine the crystal structure of this substance. However, if we were to use a rigid body, right, it's not really a mystery what are going to be the bond angles and the bond lengths in metaxylene. That's well known. So if we were to take that rigid molecule, metaxylene, and then do what's called a rigid body refinement, where we don't allow the shape of the molecule to change during the refinement. Then, because there's only one molecule in the asymmetric unit, our task is really just to find the location of that molecule and its orientation. And we only need three variables for the location and only three variables for the orientation. So that problem that was 54 variable problem now becomes a six variable problem. Now, what about paraxylene? We saw that paraxylene had a higher molecular symmetry. It was MMM. The crystal structure of paraxylene is actually quite different from that of metaxylene. It crystallizes in this monoclinic space group, P2 sub 1 over N, which, by the way, is a non-standard setting of P2 sub 1 over C. They're the same space group, basically. Uh, and that's the most common space group we encounter. We see that the unit cell volume is actually much smaller here, only 300 cubic angstroms. If we look at this for a minute, we would find out there's actually only two molecules per unit cell. How well would our heuristic of 10 cubic angstroms per atom work? This molecule also has eight carbons and 10 hydrogens, so 18. Um, at this volume, that would be 31 atoms in the unit cell, right? 310 divided by 10. How well does 18 go into 31? Well, you know, it doesn't go in an integer way, but it's closest to being 2 rather than 1. And in fact, that's what we see, 2 molecules per unit cell. Now, how does that relate to the symmetry operations of this point group? If we look at the international tables for P2 sub 1 upon N, we would see these are the Wyckoff positions. And so you notice that the multiplicity of the general position, 4, is bigger than the number of molecules in the unit cell. There are only two molecules in the unit cell. So that tells us that the center of gravity, if you want to call it that, but some point in this molecule must reside on a symmetry element. There must be symmetry elements that build out the molecule. And if you look at this projection of the crystal structure, and then I put on here in red this, some of the symmetry operations, we see, oh yeah, there's an inversion center right at the center of the molecule. You know, you could think about it as the molecule sits on site 2A. Now, there's no atom there, so there's not any atom that sits on site 2A. But because of that, it means that we only have to include, let's say, this half of the molecule in our asymmetric unit, and the other half of the molecule will be generated by the inversion center. It also constrains us to have inversion symmetry precisely in this molecule. And then the second molecule in the unit cell, which we find here at the body center, is generated either by the 2 sub 1 screw or the end glide. They're both going to take a molecule that's here at the origin and move it to here with exactly the same orientation. So when we look at paraxylene, what we see is that we have a case where the number of molecules per unit cell is smaller than the multiplicity of the general position. Sometimes we'll talk about this Z prime, the number of crystallographically independent molecules per unit cell. And in this case, it's 2 divided by 4. It's 1 half. 
So that tells us that there's only one half of a molecule in the asymmetric unit. Um, it also tells us that there is some symmetry element of the space group that imposes a symmetry on the molecule. Here it's an inversion center. Now if we were trying to, let's say, solve this crystal structure from powder diffraction data, we're going to use a rigid body again. Now we don't have to find the location of the molecule. The symmetry is telling us whenever z prime is less than 1, the position has to be associated with some symmetry operation of the group. And here the obvious one would be the inversion center. It's the only point symmetry element that's not a travel symmetry element. Um, so now, solving the crystal structure, if we assume a rigid body, would be as simple as determining the orientation of this molecule. That would only be three variables. That comes back to this idea of you know, how to approach the structures of molecular crystals. You know, we've seen that we expect to see travel symmetry operations like glides and screws, specifically two sub one screws, and we oftentimes might have inversion centers. We've learned that the Z prime, that is the number of molecules per unit cell divided by the multiplicity of the general position, tells us something useful about solving the structures of these substances. When Z prime is one, well, we just need to find the location and the orientation of that molecule in the unit cell. Of course, some other molecules might have more conformational degrees of freedom. They might have torsion angles or shapes that can change, unlike xylene. In that case, we'd have to solve those things as well. When Z prime is less than one, we see that the molecule must in some way be associated with a special position. And therefore, some of the symmetry operations of the point group will map part of the molecule back onto itself. We sometimes might encounter a case where Z prime is greater than one, which tells us that there are different molecules in the unit cell that are not related to each other by crystallographic symmetry. They are crystallographically independent. And those cases are actually quite a bit harder to solve from powder diffraction data.